Hello, everyone. It's 1 p.m. Eastern, and that means it's time to begin another Kokoros Weather Talk webinar. A very warm welcome to all of you joining us today. I'm your host, meteorologist Henry Regis. Running the technical side of our program is our very own Noah Newman. We're coming to you live from sunny Fort Collins, Colorado. For those of you who are unable to join us for our live broadcast, we are recording today's talk, and it will be available later this week on our website. All of our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by generous donations by listeners just like you. Well, today's webinar is about the process of how layers of ice build up on objects exposed to freezing precipitation, otherwise known as ice accretion. Our guest today is Jay Schaefer from Northern Vermont University, formerly Linden State, where he teaches the art of, the, excuse me, he teaches the art and science of weather forecasting. Living in Northern Vermont, Jay has ample experience forecasting winter weather and its associated hazards, including ice from wet snow and freezing rain. His research on wet snow and freezing rain icing has resulted in commercial applications to help electric utility companies prepare for winter storms and the related power outage impacts. Jay has experience with many private sector applications of winter weather, including roadways, utilities, and forensics. Jay originates from Northern New Jersey, a place familiar with ice storms. He holds a bachelor's degree from Plymouth State University, along with a master's and a PhD from the University of Utah. Jay loves the outdoors and you will likely find him hiking or skiing during his off time. Well, let's give a big Kokoros welcome to Jay Schaefer. Jay, it's great to have you with us today and uh, we really appreciate you joining us. I'm going to start off with the question that I ask all of our guests and uh, you probably have a story uh, about this yourself, but how did you become interested in weather? How did I become interested in weather? Thank you. It's, uh, I would say that I was always captivated by the power of nature, like everyone who has any sort of interest in weather, and that just stuck with me and followed that curiosity. And I want to understand why does it change and how does it change? And when I learned that you can predict it, well, that's the bug that stayed with me throughout my career. So I was the kid on snow days out in winter storms in New Jersey, kind of hooked me at about age seven or eight and grew up in the the 1980s watching the Weather Channel when all they did was weather. Um, and my dad really, I owe a lot to him for planting the seed pretty early, whether I realized it or not. Well, thanks, Jay. I, again, everybody seems to have a story and, and uh, thank you for sharing yours with us about that. Well, we're gonna give you uh, the control here and uh, Noah, if you wanna pass that on to Jay, and we'll, we'll start the uh, presentation. All right. Go ahead. Uh, can you see my screen and hear me? Okay. Look, looks good. All right. Great. Thanks. It's great for being here today. And I, I should say that I'm going to be competing with folks who are taking down a tree on the property that I'm living in. So you may be hearing the Vermont branded chainsaw in the background. I have to apologize for that. That was not planned, but it's going to be part of today's seminar, whether we like it or not. And I want to thank everyone who's here today because you all make a difference. And I've worked in the weather business for two decades and precipitation observations are the gift, the biggest gift that we can give our fields. And the, the many thousands and millions of observations that observers have taken really do help move the science forward. Even if it's a zero day or it doesn't seem like it's a whole lot, it does matter. So thanks everyone who's, who's here today. And any of uh, observers who might also be veterans, I should acknowledge, the fact that it's also Veterans Day. So thanks for your service. Jay, you know, I forgot to, in, in your introduction, I forgot to mention to people that you are our Vermont uh, state coordinator for Cocoa So we appreciate all of your help up there and what you've been doing over the, the, the past several years. Thank you. And, I, and I'm also a member of the club. I, I'm an observer and my previous location, I had about 10, 10 years of continuous data without missing an observation myself. So uh, I, I do applications related to power outages, principally in extreme weather is where my, my field is really focused in the last five to 10 years. And if we look at all the different weather hazards that cause major power outages over about a decade period, this is a report that ended in 2010, we see that snow and ice storms accounted for over a quarter of those, almost 30% during that time. And um, we talk about ice, we're gonna mostly talk about ice, but wet snow is another hazard I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on today as well. So, so we'll get into winter here. 
And I wanted to start out by talking about the different kinds of icing that we can have in the atmosphere. There's three of them. And if we categorize this, uh, the first one is rime icing. And rime icing, for anyone who might have hiked up mountains in the cold season and seen like a very thin, flaky ice that might be on trees, um, that's what rime ice is. We'll go into more details of these types in just a minute. Wet snow icing, wet snowfall, partially melted snowflakes that can stick and then maybe refreeze. In that example, we have on electrical conductor, a pretty thick accretion of wet snow. And then the last one is freezing rain. And as much as we love freezing rain, um, as beautiful as it is, another thing that I also like to say affectionately or not so affectionately is freezing rain can often be mother nature's F word because it's not the most favorite precipitation type and it can be pretty high impact. So, but we're gonna enlighten it and make the most of it today. Rime icing, for get rime icing to occur, we have to be in a cloud. The clouds are made out of super cool liquid water droplets again. And those super cool liquid water droplets freeze on contact. In this case, this is a conductor, electrical conductor element. And the ice is actually grows into the wind as the cloud moves through the element. And on this extreme picture here on the top of Mount Washington in New Hampshire, we see rime ice that's grown um, multiple feet. And this actually grows into the wind. Again, it's a thin, flakier ice, uh, relatively difficult to predict with conventional weather information. And we look for high water content clouds that are just below freezing because you don't need to have, um, you can have super cool liquid water in most clouds, um, pretty cold up to about uh, you know, minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit or so. So that's rime icing. Uh, wet snow icing, snow falls through some melted layer and can produce an accretion um, that occurs on trees and trees can then fall on power lines or roadways, or it can actually accrete on a conductor in extreme case. This is actually in Iceland, right? Where this, this element had a significant accretion of, of wet snowfall. And a key thing we look for there is an isothermal lapse rate, meaning the temperature is right around zero near rain or snow transitions and temperatures that are stationary around 32 degrees throughout storms and winter storms. And um, actually wet snow is one of those things we know less about and there's less good science on than freezing rain, believe it or not. So freezing rain icing, and this is the most studied, uh, highest impact. Freezing rain freezes on contacts after it falls through some sub-freezing layer. And there's four factors as we'll discuss today that will cause the ice to form in a certain efficiency or different shapes. The temperature at which it's falling, the wind speed, the, the precipitation rate, and it's the material characteristics itself. It turns out that near freezing temperatures, like this top right image here, we tend to have more icicles, water drips, and then it freezes. But below freezing temperatures, where you have maybe freezing rain that's occurring at 20 degrees or 22 degrees, the ice efficiency growth is pretty high and you mostly have upward growth, right? So temperatures matter, probably the most important factor there. Okay, so uh, how do we get freezing rain? And how do we determine our precipitation types? All major precipitation in the mid-latitudes pretty much starts out as snowfall. And what determines the type is really the temperature uh, through the thermal layer or through the lower level of the troposphere. So in the event of rainfall, we have a large warm layer and snow that's melted, um, and then it just falls as rain. In the uh, experience of freezing rain, we have uh, this mid-level layer of warm air and then a shallow layer of colder that's below freezing. And these, these little droplets that are falling through the cloud cannot refreeze quite fast enough. And if it's cold enough, the surface temperatures are, are sub-freezing and then you'll have ice that'll creep or form. Now, if that cold layer gets a little deeper, in this case, these ice drops will refreeze and they'll refreeze into sleet or also known as ice pellets, right? And then if it's cold enough and it's below freezing through the whole layer, then we're gonna have snowfall as our precipitation type. And, and then as this slide's notes is that long duration freezing rain is actually pretty rare. We need to have this cold air layer of that thickness that's sustained throughout the storm system. And oftentimes when we have a phase transition, when precipitation freezes on contact, it releases latent heat. And that latent heat is acts as a buffer to counter the duration of freezing rain. Okay, I'm a more of a history person here and doing some research looking at this, I thought it might be interesting to start off with like, well, where does freezing rain happen? How bad is it? 
And this was from a, an article that looked at uh, surveying freezing rain damage across uh, the United States, going back to newspaper articles all the way back to 1886. And I just want to point out um, Northeast United States. Here we have Atlanta, Georgia, Macon, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Virginia, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, South Carolina, uh, Northeast again, Tennessee, Mississippi, Arkansas. You get the idea. This is not something that uh, is geographically unique to any one location, although it does tend to be um, over the eastern United States. And in these really high impact events, freezing rain can be very high impact when it does occur, um, and they can occur relatively frequently. So um, this was an interesting study, just starting off with the early science on some of this. This is the total number of glaze icing storms, or this would be freezing rain icing storms through a 10 year period, and which was funded by the American Railroad Study. This was published back in 1959 and taken from an article published in 1981. This is agnostic to how thick the ice accretion was, just how many storms over a 10 year period occur. And we see some icing zones that are more common over the Northeast and a lot of the central and Eastern United States um, north of maybe 35 degrees north, you, know, you can get ice. And then there's some pockets in the West that have some elevation and geographic sensitivity that we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, if we update this and fast forward in the literature a little bit, this is from some research that uh, Christopher McCray was working on, a former student of mine, was part of a postdoc looking at climate change and ice storm frequency. And these are four different methods to try to understand the frequency of freezing rain is I just wanted to take a quick look at the more of a North America look. Um, generally, we see that freezing rain, and this is where we have at least a three hour duration period of freezing rain, is more likely over probably Northern and Eastern areas of the continent than Western areas. But if you include things like freezing drizzle, then we see the Columbia River Basin in uh, Washington and Oregon has a much higher frequency um, where cold pools and shallow layers of cold air can persist in the valleys causing uh, freezing drizzle and, and freezing rainfall, right? So um, our Canadian friends to the north are no strangers to this as well. And um, there's a lot of geographic sensitivity on, on, on local time scales too. Um, and if we come a little closer to the state side, and what we see is the average number of freezing rain days a season, again, agnostic to how, how heavy it is. We notice the Columbia River, Columbia River Basin area, three or four on average. But there are some corridors here in the Northeast. This is a hot spot where we have five, six, seven days a year on average where there's at least some accretion of freezing rain. And then there's another area east of the Appalachian Mountains where cold air can get uh, trapped, cold air damming pattern as we call this in the Ohio River Valley and into parts of the Midwest might have two or three days a year of freezing rain. And it goes relatively far south. If you remember winter storm Uri in Texas and how cold that was, it gives you a sense of you can get colder outbreaks and freezing rain. Um, almost all the way to the Gulf Coast. Okay, now if we look at this from, where are our Coco Ross observers? Are there every little black tot from a study that we uh, helped to publish looking at improving freezing rain accretion and the frequency of freezing rain is just the, the, the underground map layer. We see our observers are, are obviously in a lot of different locations and there's a great opportunity for our observers to help improve ice accretion measurements. And we'll talk about that towards the end of today's seminar. So a little bit about the work I've done in this field. So there's something called the National Electric Safety Code and or NESC. Um, this is based off of their three different icing zones. When you build a transmission facility or a transmission tower for electric transmission, there's certain codes and standards based on weather performance and, and climate extremes that you need to reach. And this is just the kind of NESC heavy icing, medium icing, and light icing zones categorized in three different levels. And this is radial ice thickness. We'll talk about what exactly radial ice thickness is in a minute. But in the heavy zone, we, we build our standards to at least a half inch of radial ice that's accreted on the structures. That means that each tower you build, each span of transmission wire has to be able to accommodate that much mass or load of ice. Right? And then there's also some sort of uh, concurrent wind speed and temperature performance that are come along with those standards. So these things are taken very seriously and you could generally see where the heavier, medium and light, light ice zones are based on a, you know, a construction uh, minimum standards are. And most utilities and, and people who design things 
it, at least reach this minimum standard and try to, of course, overbuild if we can. Um, another way to look at uh, the, the intensity of, of freezing rain, this is looking at a 50-year duration or a 50-year storm of ice, an ice storm um, based on the, the ASAC CE standard, which is one of the other, the secondary standard that people might use for this, um, the American Society of Civil Engineers. And uh, this is you know, published in 1991, but what we see in a once in 50 year period, anywhere in the black, you might have up to 2.2 inches of ice thickness is what this is saying. Um, and you know, I think this, this analysis and looking at some of it in the West and there's opportunities for improvement based on science that we know now with this and you know, improvements that are made upon this. But generally you can see some of the higher icing zones are more likely in Northern areas where you can get more long duration cold uh, freezing rain and then along the international border and in parts of the Northeast. Okay, so um, a little bit about ice formation on trees. So if we're gonna just look at some of the work from Dr. Uh, Kim Coder, who's uh, one of the leading experts on how ice uh, accretes on trees. And what we see is that we have in this cartoon here, a branch cross section. We've got some accumulation of ice on, on this. And then we have an icicle that's forming around this. So oftentimes when it's raining, um, water will drip down and icicles are more likely to form when you have warmer temperatures as well. Um, but water will drip down because either the ice can't form fast enough or it's raining too fast for it to form or the temperatures just aren't cold enough for it to freeze by the time it gets around the branch. But the other thing we see is that there's this thick consistent uh, layer of ice. We call that the radial ice. The average thickness around the diameter is what we call the radial ice thickness itself. <laughs> Now, if we take a little bit of wind and we add wind to this diagram here in the top left, we don't have as much wind and then we add a little bit of wind. Well, we can see that wind will tend to distort how ice can grow on trees too. And you could have different percentages of the fraction that freezes based off of the strength of the wind. What we do know is the stronger the wind, generally the more uh, ice accretes because it just helps to blow the, the latent heat away from the ice itself. As the ice forms, we tend to have this uh, situation where we have uh, latent heat that is, is released and then the wind blows that away and it makes the efficiency of, of the freezing faster if you're able to move that heat, that convective heat loss faster when you have a little bit of wind. Now, um, if we look at this from a wind and no wind perspective, wind also tends to distribute ice more uniformly around this cross-section diameter here. Well, again, this is our tree branch here. Whereas if we don't have as much wind, we tend to have growth that's upward and, and not um, necessarily distributed all the way around the cylinder. And if we had one inch of freezing rain and we distribute all of that freezing rain, we were able to actually freeze it. Now water does expand a little bit. It's about eight or 9% as it freezes, um, but we would have about uh, 0.35 inches of radial ice of one inch of liquid depth around the diameter, just based on how we distribute depth over the, diameter of a circle. Um, and then that would be equivalent to about 0.71 inches if, if it was just accreting um, in a no wind situation, right? Um, and there are lots of assumptions that go into it, but you know the ice formation is very dependent upon and very fickle to those factors on a much local scale. So what do we use in our field to actually predict ice accretion? Well, a uh, paper by um, these two authors here and published in 2016 in Weather and Forecasting. This is the commonly, um, most commonly used model, some variant of this called the freezing rain accumulation model or FRAM. And FRAM basically converts freezing rain to ice thickness. Just because we know there's freezing rain doesn't mean we actually know how much ice thickness is gonna form. We know we have to use these variables to determine the efficiency of that ice accretion. And um, most important one is basically a measure of temperature. All right, we call that the wet bowl temperature in this case. And then the second one is the rate at which precipitation is falling. If the precipitation is falling faster um, or too fast, you're not gonna get as much ice forming as if it's falling slower, right? And colder temperatures more form more ice than warmer temperatures, as I mentioned earlier. And the last one is the wind. Um, faster wind speeds tend to be more efficient than, than slower wind speeds, right? Um, excuse me here. Okay, so ice thickness, a little bit about ice thickness versus radial ice thickness. Uh, this can get kind of confusing quickly, all right? 
but we tend to measure the, the depth or elevated ice is also known as elevated horizontal ice. And the National Weather Service has now just been done a better job of making this distinction and their forecast for ice thickness. But the depth of this in one dimension is known as ice thickness or elevated horizontal ice versus radial ice is again that radius, the, 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 the amount of ice around a diameter. So imagine this being your tree branch here, right? <laughs> And we care about radial ice from an engineering standpoint, typically. Uh, meteorologically, when you go measure ice and you outside during an ice storm, if you've experienced any sort of icing event, we tend to measure this. You want to kind of show, oh, I had the most ice in my tree, or you look for the longest dimension in one place. But that's not true. Radial ice, the radial ice is you, you equally distribute that all, all the way around your cylinder. All right, let's try to show that visually a little bit more. So radial ice, you might actually take a measurement um, of all the ice and the diameter around it before and after to know like roughly what that ice thickness is and the change of that. In this case, this was uh, one of our Coco Ross observers who actually cleverly used a piece of PVC pipe and um, just through some training, a little bit of back and forth and a few emails was able to uh, set, set them up to help measure radial ice. All right, no one method I would say is perfect for this and having a picture is worth a thousand words as they say, and then ice thickness might be, you know, in this case, this is uh, just looking at ice growth upwards in one, one dimension here. And again, that's another term for that might be elevated flat ice on this. Um, ice thickness is always gonna be less than radial ice because again, we have to distribute all that ice around a cylinder. And the idea of it being a cylinder is, 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 is more or less how you can apply that to a power line conductor because that's the cylinder element. Um, so that's why we think about it from a radial ice perspective. Okay, so here's an example of, of one dimensional ice thickness. And in this observation, you might measure about a half inch of ice in one direction, right? Um, this is from an ice storm actually in my backyard in 2013, uh, which we lost power for, for, for two days. And, um, and this is not now, this is not how we would measure the radial ice. Radial ice, if we had to measure this, Technically, what we would need to do is actually take the mass of that, know the diameter of the branch, and then using a little bit of algebra, um, determine the radial ice from that. And it's not feasible or realistic to do this with every little observation or for anyone who's not highly trained, um, advanced degree in our field or really cares a lot about this. So oftentimes these one dimensional ice thickness observations are good with a picture. You can see the icicle formation and a picture in multiple directions really helps us try to categorize like how much ice really did occur. So, and we're doing better with observations in our field, but we still have a little bit of a ways to go with this. All right, an example would be um, half inch. If we were to distribute this, we had a half inch of radial ice, um, we would have actually 1.27 inches of one dimensional ice when you take that around the whole cylinder. If you think about the relationship of the, um, of the diameter uh, to the circle, it's basically following that ratio, the circ circumference of a circle, sorry. So ice storm of 1998, some of you may have this in your memory here. This was a modeled uh, ice thickness map. So we, we simulated this, some other research we've done. It did stimulate the storm a little too warm. So these ice accretion mounts near the international border should probably be a little further south, also in the part to Maine. Um, but we see areas that had over two inches of, of ice thickness. And, and this is, you know, and it had a very large storm footprint, over $4 billion of damage in Quebec from this storm. And in Vermont, New Hampshire, we had significant damage, but it was much more elevation based, much more sensitive to how high you were. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm also just nursing, uh, getting off a cold for the last two days here. All right, so here's, um, these are some observations that were published uh, from work that was done with the Cold Region Research Lab in, in Hanover, New Hampshire by uh, Kathleen Jones and, and others. And what we see here in, in Hanover, New Hampshire, was that at an elevation around 500 to 800 feet, there was almost no ice. But you went up an elevation to 1,000 to 1,300 feet and there was one inch of ice, All right? And that pattern generally persisted in a lot of Vermont, New Hampshire. Right? So that begs the question, how and why did that happen? Well, it turns out that that latent heating was probably enough to warm up the deeper valleys and the lowest elevations to mitigate the, the most significant ice accretion. 
and help to elevate it at a higher elevation, all right? So these are observations of, of ice, um, estimated ice loads and uh, 1.8 inches, 1.0 1 inches, 1.3 inches here, all right, um, based on a storm survey. And the ice was able to stay loaded on things. So what, uh, what Kathleen Jones did was she, she actually drove around and did storm surveys um, following sites and put many miles on this. And uh, you know her job for a few years was actually to chase ice storms um, after they occurred to help research them and understand them. So very strong elevation sensitivities. And then you got up above like 3,000 feet elevation and it was too warm. So you top of Mount Washington didn't have any ice because it was that, that really warm layer aloft was, was pretty strong as a part of this storm. And then here's some pictures that, that she took uh, as part of her storm surveying on the left-hand side, right? It's known as crescent ice formation, more upward growth in this example. Here's a large accretion of ice on the windward side of a car antenna, just enough wind that the ice had created a little bit into the wind here. Now, this is a pretty thin wire of fence and we see ice growth kind of radial sense, but there's also icicles forming below this. And then this is a, called a Navi accretion of ice in different areas. So ice can form in a lot of different ways based on the very local environment, the substance it's freezing onto, the local wind environment, um, and the precipitation rate. So then here's a picture from the ice storm of 98 from Hydro-Quebec, and uh, they had uh, catastrophic, you know, their transmission towers collapse and cascading failures that had resulted from just um, accumulations of, of ice. And they've since over-engineered things and put it in more monitoring systems. But I think if a storm happened like this again, we wouldn't be better prepared, but we can't avoid impacts because um, you can only overbuild things so much from a storm like that. <coughs> Excuse me. So more recently, uh, ice accretion from December 2008 ice storm, more of a southern New England event, kind of in that corridor where we have a high frequency of icing events. And here we had over one to one and a half inches of ice thickness, that one dimensional ice thickness and kind of near the Massachusetts, New Hampshire border and parts of, of New York state as well. And most of the failures occurred in this case were less, you know, the transmission facilities weren't as affected by this, but mostly um, trees coming into right of ways and whatnot. <coughs> I may need to pause just for a second just to get a drink of water. I'm actually gonna need to do that just to save my voice here. I'll just be about 30 seconds, hold on. Okay, much better, much better. Um, so there were some structural failures. There's two types of failures you could have for outages uh, if you really want to generalize it. Trees fall into right of ways, right? And about 75% of our power lines in New England have you know, trees nearby. Um, and then, or the, the actual infrastructure itself fails uh, itself because of the loading onto it. Um, this storm is more tree conflicts and we have lots of issues with you know, trees and we love our trees, but they tend to be problematic or um, near power lines, of course. And it's not necessarily the trees right in the right of way because the right of ways are pretty small. It's actually the danger trees outside the right of way that fall in. And there's not much that we could often do about those trees um, because they're you know, privately owned. All right, a little bit about wet snow, just a few slides on wet snow. The October wet snowstorm of 2011 is worth mentioning here across the Northeast. And you know, again, most of my work, you know, here I am up here in Northern Vermont, this is kind of roughly where I am. Um, and we had this accretion of really heavy wet snowfall. This is liquid equivalent of how much mass of wet snow over two inches of liquid water equivalent had fallen in, this, in a similar corridor here. And um, you know, catastrophic outages that took over five, six days to restore power. And you know, the other thing about this is some of the other work we've done about climate change in, in the Northeast and generally is that a warmer and wetter climate will produce uh, more wet snowfall in climates that get a moderate amount of snowfall. Um, in places that don't get as much snowfall, you're probably just gonna see less snowfall overall, but uh, our climate zone in kind of middle and Northern latitudes, we should expect actually increased risks from wet snowfall because of that. And okay, a little technical of a diagram. This is based on some work that was done in Japan. Um, so there are other places, of course, that deal with wet snow and ice. Uh, there's plenty of places in China. Um, a lot of the Scandinavian countries experienced a lot of icing 
All right, of course, our neighbors to the north as well. So this is there's, there's a lot of areas in the in the world that have these challenges. And um, this is some proposed research, and we've also done some research that's looked at wet bulb temperatures to try to understand whether or not you're going to actually have wet snowfall accreting or not. And everywhere, kind of inside this red zone, is where you roughly have some sort of measure of temperature and humidities, where you might get an accretion of of wet snowfall. Um, the other thing I should point out here, based on some of the research we've done, is that wet snowfall should get more attention than it does. It's, uh, I would argue its risks, uh, because of its frequency just being higher, are probably three or four times higher than the overall risks uh, from a power outage standpoint than freezing rain, at least in the Northeast United States. Of course, when you get a catastrophic ice storm, it can be more, more significant and even worse than a wet snowstorm. Um, but wet snow is just something that happens more frequently. Therefore, the overall risk burden is, is higher, All right? So uh, some pretty sensitive areas in this where a few percentage points in relative humidity and a few degrees on either side of this, you could have rain versus dry snowfall. Um, so wet snowfall and just like freezing rain has these very sensitive margins and just a few degrees can, can change everything. I like to say that you know, the freezing level or the freezing uh, temperature points is just one of like the most uh, significant force multipliers of, of uncertainty. Um, trying to get, getting the air temperature forecast right around freezing when there's precipitation occurring is the most important thing that we should be thinking about from a winter risk standpoint. Um, you know, we don't really care if it's 65 degrees or 60, but if it's 30 degrees or 35 and it's going to be freezing rain or, or not, then that's pretty important. So uh, here's an example. And I also wear my hat as a, a tech entrepreneur and I'm I have a four-year-old bootstrap business that does consulting work mostly with the local power company is Green Mountain Power. It's one of our customers and wearing that hat. In the left-hand side, this is a wet snowstorm, probability of wet snowfall exceeding a certain threshold um, over some duration. And the right-hand side, we developed a method to actually come up with an observations of wet snowfall in a gridded sense using some you know, methods that we've developed. Um, so we did pretty good. You have to get forecasts and observes, and there's a picture of of wet snowfall and uh, some of the outages um, that occurred. It wasn't that high impact of a storm, but enough to know that they had to work and maybe have their workforce uh, fully dialed in for that storm. So they always want to know how bad is the storm going to be, number one. Uh, when is it going to hit? So if it's a weekend or if it's outside of the regular work day, they need to have their crews all ready. And then where is it going to hit? Um, so <clears throat> where do they need to stage crews potentially? Um, or, or move some resources around ahead of time, right? <clears throat> Those are the things that we try to help them with, with wet snow, ice, and wind. Okay, so um, having done this and trying to get research on ice observations, in Vermont, um, we're, we piloted for several winters. Uh, this is just a table that I derived, very um, simple way of looking at how much ice may accumulate based off of some category, just to make this easy for an observer to um, go outside, take a picture, and generally tell me, um, is this a category three accumulation of ice or category four? So um, when there is a potentially ice, I message all our Kokoros observers, and I'm basically just say, hey, send me the category you think it's going to accumulate out, and if you can take a picture, that's great. So the three pictures you see here are, this is probably an accumulation that's like around a one or two. All right, um, that's from one of, these are all from Kokoros observers for storms. And the middle one might be like a, a two, all right? Maybe a three, probably more of like a late, a higher on the two side of it. Um, and then you can see all the pictures are good because they have some sort of measuring um, device along them. And then this is probably more of a three here on the right-hand side. This is the 10th of an inch increment Kokoros, more like a two or a three. So we get a lot of high frequency icing events that are kind of in that, you know, two or three range. And the big storms are much more rare because long duration freezing rain just doesn't happen as much. You, know, you need a lot more cold air in place for a longer duration. Um, but this has actually shown to be really helpful and useful in getting information from this. And there's definitely some quality control for this, but it allows people to do this in a way where they don't have to go be like, okay, can you take off that branch? And then could you melt all the water off of it? And then could you weigh that? And then could you 
Yeah, so that just gets to be really too complicated. We're trying to develop a better way for Coco Ross observers to do this. This obviously is very regional specific, right, to Vermont. So, but something like this could be adopted uh, more generally for that's a little more um, regionally based potentially. And then we've taken that data, we've done all sorts of research with it. This is an example of ice thickness for a recent storm. And then now we're superimposing this on Green Mountain Power's overhead power distribution system. So we created some sort of spatial analysis and they resampled that raster or the gridded data onto these overhead line segments to show you where the greatest ice accumulation was, which is in Eastern um, Vermont here. And uh, this has been useful. Um, so that simple scale that we've developed here, um, I think we've shown that it can be used for research and uh, provide useful, some information is valuable to not having any at all. And, and then more recently, and I was one of the co-authors on this along with, with Noah and others that I uh, was piloting different ways of measuring ice accretion. And in this configuration here, we've got different types of um, dowels uh, that are different substances or different types of materials here, all right? And in some sort of sample plot. And then literally what was done here is at a time when the weather was good for ice accretion was to spray a fire hose essentially, and then watch the ice build up along it and then measure it to see um, how that performs um, and how you might be able to develop a simple way of doing this, all right? Uh, so this is in, in central New Hampshire in the Hubbard Brook Research Facility, which is on all sorts of interesting research, going back to some of the early freezing rain research and the, the forest, the experimental research forest that uh, is maintained down there. All right, um, National Weather Service does a great job. I think that for what our taxpayer dollars here in this country do, we get an excellent service for it, but there are limitations and those limitations are mostly forced by the science. Um, and I just want to point those out here where our opportunities are at the same time. You know, for ICE, we only have lead time for most of their products now that's like three days ahead. Um, there's a need for longer duration than that, but, you know, the uncertainty factor, maybe we shouldn't go further than that. And then we don't quite have probabilistic ice secretion forecasts. We do a much better job with snowfall depth forecasts, although we don't have a good, like, okay, there's a 25% chance you're going to get at least a half inch of ice. All right, that sort of information isn't quite out there. Uh, and there's no really good way to determine wet snow accretion from total snowfall. So right now we just say, yep, you're gonna get 12 inches of snow, 12 to 18 inches, and it's probably gonna be mostly wet. And like, that's the best we could do. It's not like, yeah, it's gonna start off wet and then go dry, or it's, you're gonna have 30% of it wet. Um, so we could do better, I think, with wet snow our field generally. Um, and then we don't have the good product base in the National Weather Service products for freezing rain are really tuned around power outages, not so much transportation. And there's a new term that I've been developing, I'm trying to get this to stick here in the Northeast, is rapid onset freezing rain. When precipitation starts as freezing rain and roadways have not been treated and it catches people off guard, all it takes is that first hundredth of an inch of ice is the worst for transportation applications. All right, so um, that's something to be it's for us all to think about and how we could do better there. Um, you know, we've done a better job with snow squall warnings and we've taken some of the knowledge we know about you know, thunderstorm warnings and, and looking at how we can implement that into if we have a snow squall or heavy period of snowfall, snow squall. But we, we should, I think there's an opportunity for some sort of parallel development of rapid onset freezing rain. I don't know exactly what you call it, um, but oftentimes freezing rain in most storms is mixed phase. So you get a little bit of time where it might transition to freezing rain and you already can put some chemical on the road and you're out and about. But if it starts as freezing rain and you don't have any sort of pretreatment policies in place and it's not a really high detectable event, um, that's when it's really high impact. And agencies of transportation, of course, don't like this and they could lose the road very quickly and it's a serious threat to safety. All right, what have we done? And what are some of the things that are out there? You know, over a decade ago, um, Sperry and Pilts came up with this ice accumulation index, categories zero to five, which is trying to look at this again from more of a, an outage, power outage standpoint. Um, this has since been, you know, this is this has all been trademarked and it's was brought under the lens of one of the private sector companies in the Midwest here. But the whole idea is it takes 
uh, ice accumulation, and then looks at wind speed to then come up with where your category is. So uh, category three, ice accu accumulation between 0.5 and 0.75, and you have a wind speed between 15 and 25 as a, as a level three storm, right? Um, and this, so, I mean, this is better than nothing, but it ha has some regional, regional variability to this in terms of how much infrastructure you have, how well your utilities maintain your trees along your lines, and a variety of other factors, right? Um, I don't think we're quite ready to say this is going to be a category five ice storm universally around the country. Although I think there's a definitely utility in being able to simplify it just to help people explain it and understand because we know about category five hurricanes, for example. Um, and there's going to be so much variability with ice, maybe with elevation, that it's difficult to just to do this. Uh, it's not the same problem. Okay, uh, a few more slides here. We're going to wrap up. Um, here's an example of what I do uh, wearing my other private sector hat. This is a product that we've developed and we go out five days with our ice accumulations. This is probability of at least a half inch of elevated ice thickness. And then we can see our principal ice accretion zone near the international border in the parts of North Central Maine. All right, we were watching this in the Champlain Valley um, here in Vermont and parts of Northern New York. And um, this is the kind of information that there's the private sector um, you know, I think some of those products are feeling a little more because it's just the information just isn't there from a storm planning perspective, All right? So I think here's where some of the opportunity is. Now there's, there's always a pretty high error bar or uncertainty around this, but having some sort of forecast here, some information is better than not having anything at all than shooting blind, my opinion. And then here's the research I mentioned uh, over here in New Hampshire, a few more pictures of it and, um, you know, doing work and. And it's sometimes we just go out and, well, we just spray the trees and see how the trees respond to ice secretion and how resilient they are, and how the actual ice builds up on the trees. Like this, there's lots of subfields and parts of the science from predicting it to seeing how the materials respond to how you design um, icing and how we think about transportation impacts. There's a lot of places this intersects. Didn't even get to aviation, of course. Aviation has figured out a lot of these problems, so. <clears throat> All right, a little bit about climate change. Just how do, where are we going here, at least in New England and the Northeast around wet snow and ice? Uh, wet snowstorms, we actually did a project here in the next 30 years, we expect them to increase and, and then we have a medium level of confidence with that. Um, but ice storms are still kind of a, uh, a wild card right now. Ice storms, uh, we don't think there's a significant change to their frequency or intensity necessarily with climate change, but, but again, those are lower to moderate confidence. Uh, because of some of the unique meteorological components that you need for those. In a warming climate, it makes sense that some areas might be less prone to ice because you just don't have as cold air masses. Um, and then maybe you have storm systems that are more transitional and not long duration and the cold air doesn't last as in there. So there's competing factors with climate change there with what the ice storm risk looks like. But uh, we feel pretty confident that the wet snow risks are going to increase, at least in our neck of the woods in the Northeast, to a moderate level of confidence. Okay, that's, uh, that's about where I wanna stop. You know, one of the things that I also like to affectionately say as a, as a meteorologist, uh, you know, our superpowers predicting the future. And, uh, you know, I like to say that I'm one of the first responders to the future. And thanks for listening here today. It's great to be with you all. Thank you, Jay. I really appreciate uh, your great presentation here and a lot of stuff uh, I learned watching this that I was not aware of before. Uh, I've got a couple quick questions for you that I'm gonna ask, and then we're, if you folks wanna type in their questions, we'll get to those. Um, so three different ones here, black ice. People talk about, you know, there's black ice out on the road. What, what, is, what is that all about? Yeah, well, black ice is just ice that it accumulates and you can't see it that well on the road. So it looks, the road looks black, so it's pretty transparent. That's, that's how we define that. And then black ice does usually form from freezing rain falling on to pave pavement and then forming ice. Um, so black ice is dangerous in that you can't always see it, come up on it quickly, and it can form relatively quickly on, an, on a roadway that's untreated, meaning there's no chemical that's been applied to it, no salt. Okay, my next one is the, uh, is there a measurement of the largest diameter of ice um, on record? So uh, ice accreted on, What's the record right now? For oh, yeah, you know, I'd have to look that up. 
um, I think you get to a places that are just so ridiculous that things break that okay. we, may, we may not know the answers to those things. Yep. Um, I want to say between three and four inches of, wow. of, of radial secretion. That's like three or four inches all the way around the diameter. Um, and the ice storm of 1998, I want to say, had around two inches of, of, of radial ice at, at its maximum. Yeah. Okay. And, and the last one I had here was that is there one place you would say uh, either in the U.S. or somewhere else that gets the the most the uh, thickest ice yearly. So is there a hot spot? I know you showed a map of different places, but if you were to pick one town or one one kind of part of a state uh, in the U.S. or Canada, is there one that pops into the top of your head right away, or is that very? Yeah, I, I think if you tried to weigh that with population impacts a little bit, um, then I would look at the St. Lawrence Valley, actually, in you know, the greater Montreal metropolitan area as it extends down the Champlain Valley into Burlington as a place that gets a high frequency of freezing rain events. Um, in terms of the magnitude, I think each of these unique storms is so special that it's hard to generalize that more on a, where the worst icing occurs. Of course, the top of Mount Washington, we get the most rime icing. Sure. That's, that's just because we have a very unique place. We're in there in the clouds 70% of the time. Right. Yep. So, so I'm going to say like the St. Lawrence Valley generally is probably the hot spot. And I'm, I'm going to share my screen with you real quickly if I can do that. Um, let's see here. I, I took some pictures last year uh, when I was, um, let's see if I can share this one. So this is, there we go. I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, this is in my backyard in April. We had uh, a, like a freezing rain event, but the rain had hit uh, on the, the uh, I guess it was the metal chair. And you can see the drop starting there on the left. And then the, you can watch it and you can see the ice starting to form in the drop there, which was kind of cool. Uh, I don't know if you, you've seen stuff like that before, but it just gave me more appreciation of that. So. Cool. That's a beautiful picture. You can see the reflection in that there. And um, I, yeah, the way ice, ice, you know, in order for water to freeze, it needs something to freeze onto is a super cool liquid. So whatever imperfection it found there on the chair, it was starting, that's where it started to freeze from. Yep. And, and, and it's interesting, the ice at the, started freezing at the bottom of the drop, huh. uh, which was, which was interesting there. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go back to your screen. We'll leave that up. Um, Let's see, I'm going to stop sharing here. And if you can put your slide back up again, just so we have that as our background. There we go. That sounds great. So we're going to take some questions for you uh, here in the next 20 minutes or so. And uh, we'll take them as they come in. If you guys have a question, uh, please uh, put where you're from and your name, and we'll, we'll try to get that one answered on the air. So Mary uh, it was curious on the map you showed earlier, I assume she lives in Illinois. Why the uh, center of ice uh, freezing rain in the middle of Illinois? So is there a reason for that one? Yeah, so um, not necessarily Illinois in particular. I think I'm not too familiar with the geography of or the frequency of, of weather north to south in Illinois, how it might affect that. Um, there is a sweet spot you need for freezing rain to occur where you have a shallow layer of cold air, enough of warm air aloft. And climatologically, the way I would answer that is that central Illinois is more likely to have that. Then southern Illinois might just have be too warm for more freezing rain. And northern Illinois is just cold enough to have more sleep or, or even just pure snow. So I suspect that that's probably just the climatological signal for that. Okay, here's William in Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. And he was wondering, would it make sense to add a horizontal PVC pipe or dowel to the rain gauge post for measuring ice? And if so, which di what diameter would, would you want to use on that? Uh, yes, we, we've actually tried that, like a, a wood dowel or PVC pipe. And it turns out that the substance you use is pretty, pretty important because how that conducts heat away. And in my opinion is we want to try to simulate like where the impacts are. So a piece of wood, if you're concerned about ice accretion on trees is probably the best thing to use. So this is actually kind of on our short list of things to pilot with Coco Ross is, is just put a, like a 18 inch wood dowel, um, four inch, four, four feet off the ground, just opposite kitty corner to the precipitation can that you have there. 
Um, so what, what diameter? I, I think an inch and a half diameter is what we were experimenting with right now. Okay, and, and uh, Wendy and Christina both kind of more, uh, again, for Kokoros observers measuring, um, if, if a Kokoros observer reports ice thickness, what would you want to see? Would you want a photo? Would you want the diameter measurements and so forth? And then um, uh, let's see, Wendy was, um, no, no, that was, uh, that was Christina's message there. I'm trying to read all these here real quick. And, um, and so what, what would you want to see from a, a uh, in addition to that? Yeah, I, I feel like yes to everything, but we don't have a great way to capture pictures, I think right now there. And, but uh, in the comment section and adding a little more narrative, that helps to decipher it. And, you know, picture is worth a thousand words and there could be sensitivity to the ice forming on your deck versus the tree in your backyard. So um, a picture that has some sort of qualifier or like a ruler in it, or even your finger in it, to just know like what kind of scale it is would be helpful. Yeah. Great. Jim, Jim asked, um, why is ice distribution distorted with no wind? He said there were uh, two different graphs of no wind ice at the start of your presentation. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Um, so it could, gravity can distort ice too, in terms of how it forms around the diameter. I think that's the other factor that I didn't get to talk about all that much. And just cause water is going to, water is going to fall onto the cylinder and then it's going to roughly move down around it. Um, and if you have wind, it will tend to maybe shift it around the diameter, but wind can also work it a little bit more effectively around the diameter too. But uh, yeah, gravity is the other factor in all of this. That's, and so I guess that's, that's the easy answer. Uh, Joe writes in, did the winter storm in Texas that crippled the power system uh, that impacted the national code, um, what, what did that, was that what you showed at the beginning of your presentation? I was curious. Um, I had mentioned Winter Storm Uri, but uh, I didn't, none of the graphics I showed were from that storm in particular. And uh, it was more the cold temperatures in that storm that were the impact in, in any sort of ice accretion. So basically the power system was not winterized in Texas appropriately. And if they actually looked at the last 30 years of weather data, then that, 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 that it was just poor planning, quite honestly. Um, and there was, it wasn't just the fact that you know, ice, uh, wind turbines were iced over. Yeah, that was a factor, but you know, just weren't, weren't expecting temperatures to be so cold and it hadn't been that cold since 1989, um, hence the impacts that we had. Here's an interesting question from Eugene. Uh, she writes in, or he, I'm sorry, uh, if the ground has ice and snow all over it, and a live power line falls, can you get electrocuted because of the water on the ground everywhere? That, that, hmm. um, yes, you probably could. Light, uh, electricity will follow the path of least resistance always, which if it's already hitting the ground, it's probably not gonna be you unless you're between the line and where it's trying to get to the ground. And if that happens to be meltwater or something like that, then that would not be a good place to be. So yeah, always stay clear of, any sort of down power lines, even if you think it's dead, it might not be dead. And it's best to just call um, 911 and tell them, and then they'll, they'll call the power company. Sue writes in and she wants to know, does the roughness or smoothness of what the ice is forming affect the ice accumulation? Absolutely, it does. It's another one of those nuances that the, you know, even the type of tree bark can affect that. Um, the, the finish you may have on an electrical conductor, right? There's different types of conductor, um, you know, the diameter of the conductor. So yeah, on a smaller scale, and I'm not an expert in, you know, nanoscience, but there we're, we're actually looking at one of, there's some other technologies and nano coatings to, on, on conductors to try to help them so that they don't actually have ice that will build up on them. And I'm not as familiar with that technology, but I know it's something that's been discussed. Great. Karen from Northern Illinois, she's a new to the Kokoros community. She wants to know, is there a special ruler that uh, can be used to measure the ice? So is there a certain type of ruler that you would recommend? Yeah. 
So if you anything is better than nothing there, even if you're just taking a picture with a, a you know ruler that has sixteenth of an inch increments in it. And if you're going to start to measure the ice thickness or or the radius um, around something, then you know some sort of caliper can be good to use that you just can easily measure the diameter from this. Um, and those are relatively cheap to pick up. So I think if, if we were going to do this in Coco Ross and send out this, I, we would want to have some sort of scientific caliper that could measure maybe on a, you know, a, 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 a hundredth of an inch increments that would be good for that. Okay, I'm looking at a couple other ones here coming in. Um, uh, Valerie writes in, what were the weather scientists doing during winter storm Yuri while the general public in the U.S. was trying to survive? Has anything improved during then? So what, what, what was there? I guess the, I'm not sure what she's really asking yeah. this question. So uh, the winter storm Yuri was um, well forecast and anticipated. And I think if you were to look at the meteorological you know, performance during that storm, um, there were, was an anticipation a week ahead for the planners in ERCOT to plan for that storm. Um, you know, they didn't anticipate obviously the demand of this and the system was not winterized well enough. So, um, you know, I'm going to defend us meteorologists actually performing pretty well. We cannot ex uh, forecast a storm of that magnitude more than, you know, maybe five or seven days ahead. Um, but we had that in our sights and it was there. But uh, the preparedness factor for that storm just wasn't where it should have been. David writes in and he wants to know if the um... He lives in Picton, Ontario, and was that uh, the western limit of that ice storm in 98, one of the worst storms on record? The western extent? Yeah, it was like southern Ontario. There were some impacts there. Sorry, now the wood chipper just got going here, so I apologize for the background noise. Uh, we're not hearing it, which is good. So oh, good. That's great. Uh, Pat in Fort Collins wants to know, should the Kokoros wooden dowel be painted that you use? No, I think natural wood is probably best. Uh, again, trying to simulate just more the natural environment. Okay. Uh, Joe writes, icing on bridges does freezing change with river or dry land below. So does it freeze quicker if the, gra uh, the ground below is frozen? Yes, that could have an influence on it. And bridges do freeze faster just because they can cool from below. And, uh, you know, some of the newer technologies and higher traffic bridges do have actually salt application systems that someone remotely can put chemical on the road to try to avoid rapid icing that may happen on bridges. Um, and then if there is local moisture source, like there's a river below it, if there's a cool night and there's evaporation of moisture, that can be like a secondary risk factor where you might have some ice fog that could form onto the road um, in certain situations. Mary writes in and she wants to know, would you please give the dimensions again of the ice accumulation dowel, one and a half inch diameter, four feet away, but how long? Oh, eight, 18 inches long roughly is I think what we were shooting on and four feet off the ground, meaning it's around the same height as the, if you put your, your precipitation uh, gauge on a four by four post, and that's like four feet off the ground and you just take the dowel and put that like six inches from the top, um, and put that horizontal, that's roughly the idea that I think we, we've been experimenting with. Okay, Brenda, Brenda wants to know from Indiana, and uh, this question is, what do you call that the pipes radial ice when it is a small crusting? Well, I'm um, not understanding this question. Yeah, well, Sorry, could you repeat that again, Henry? Yeah, she wanted to know what, what she wrote was, what do you call that pipes radial ice when it is a small crusting. I'm not sure what she's asking there. Brent, if you want to rewrite that, that will come back to that one here. Um, okay. And uh, so Andrew in, in New Brunswick says that he finds metric rulers more convenient to use. What, what do you find with this? Yeah. Well, I so wish we- That's where you are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The imperial system is uh, probably inferior to the metric system, but we struggle with that here in the States. So I might have to agree with you there. Peyton wants to know, what is grapple? So what between, you know, you got ice and then what, what, 
there's a term grapple out there. He wants to know what that ah, is. Ah, grapple. Yes, I had a professor in undergrad, Dr. Joseph Zabransky, and uh, he would kind of giggle and say, grapple's my favorite word when I was first learning about the term as an undergraduate. And uh, grapple is basically, I like to call it baby hail or hail embryo. It's something that's not quite hail and it's more than a snowflake. So it's um, a snowflake that's gone up and down a little bit within a cumulus cloud that has accumulated a little more water on it. And, and it looks like a, very, a little cone and it feels kind of like a piece of styrofoam and that it's really like, like a, a low density piece of ice. Um, and it typically forms in more convective showers. So you may have like a snow shower, like a high intensity snow shower, and you might get little pieces of grapple that form in that. So um, we'll call it baby, baby hail is another kind of affectionate name for it. And uh, it's hard to describe unless you see it. That's the best I could put in words. Thanks. Michael in Huntington wants to know, uh, again, just trying to figure out here, is the accumulation on the dowel measured as a difference in the circumference of the dowel and the circumference of the ice. So you would subtract out the circumference of the dowel yeah. from the actual circumference of the yeah, ice. You could do it that way. Uh, and again, we don't have standards, simple standards for this. And if you're gonna do circumference, then you probably need a tape measure to go around that and a pretty higher resolution tape measure to know what that is. And, and then just using some math, um, we could determine the ice thickness from that. Okay. Well, we're going to, we're going to leave it at that for today. There's a few more questions out there. We'll have Jason, uh, we'll email you guys with the, with those answers, if you don't mind, uh, Jay, following up on that. Sure. And uh, that would be great. So again, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and uh, being with us. And again, if you live in Vermont and have questions uh, about Coco Ross, uh, Jay is your state coordinator here, so feel free to, to contact him. He's done a great job with that state. We've seen a lot of observations there, and we want to see that grow over the next uh, next year or so as well. So again, thank you, Jay, and we appreciate that. Thanks. Nice well, to be here today. Have a good day, everyone. Well, as we close out today's program, we want to let you know that our next Weather Talk webinar will be taking place on Thursday, January 13th. So mark that one on your calendars. It's one of our annual favorites where meteorologist Greg Carbon of NOAA's Weather Prediction Center will, will review the top weather events of 2021. And you won't want to miss this one. We currently have the registration information up on our website. So uh, you can go ahead and register that for that uh, as, right now, today, if you want. That'd be great. Uh, before I forget, when signing up, off, signing off today, please take the survey that will pop up on your screen. I just take a second or two. And so until we meet again, uh, stay safe and healthy. We want to wish, wish you guys a happy holiday season coming up. And so Henry Regis here for the rest of the Kokoros team saying goodbye for now and uh, wishing you a good rest of the week ahead. Take care. Bye-bye.